All right, sorry about that. So I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about when I was in Egypt, and then talk about a whole bunch of things about the region. Uh, we already talked about ancient civilizations, and part of the reason why within Africa, one of the reasons why, well, we know a lot about Egypt is because of the dry climate. Uh, it left a lot of a lot of a lot of things didn't rot away from the weather, right? <clears throat> Thanks. Um, and I showed you guys uh, a short video looking at some some things in this region. Uh, when I was there, this was January 2011. So this is just a couple weeks before the revolution. Um, I took this photo just because uh, the beginnings of the Arab Spring had already started. Uh, and I took this picture because it was reminding me of the the news stories at the time. Does anyone remember the readings talk about the Arab Spring a bit? Does anyone remember specifically what happened in Tunisia on the start of the Arab Spring? Nope. Yeah. Didn't the group member self-immolate in protest of government policies? That is exactly correct, yes. Um, uh, set yourself on fire. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you the backstory a little bit. It was a fruit vendor, not not unlike uh, this situation, um, but it was in, in Tunisia. But a lot of countries in this region, the governments were not responsive to people. And on top of that, um, the policing was was a weird hodgepodge of rules and so this fruit vendor specifically uh when he would encounter the police which would happen a lot they would basically kind of harass him uh he would have to kind of pay them off uh bribes and things like that are kind of uh had become a part of a lot of the different cultures of the region um and it's one of those things where it's so random because it depends on how many times you're going to run into someone what they're going to decide, how much they're going to shake you down for, that kind of a thing. Uh, when we were there as tourists, there are all kinds of checkpoints and stuff. And sometimes you go to a checkpoint and they would say, oh, there's a, a $10 fee for whatever. It's like, okay. Sometimes you'd go and there'd be $20 or $30 fee. And it seemed really random, and that's because it kind of was. Um, there's a lot of graft, a lot of corruption, specifically with the police. So there's a fruit vendor who... You know, his job is he's getting food and selling it to people. Um, but he was having to pay so much uh, in different fees and things uh, that he wasn't able to make any money. And he was just going into debt. Uh, and he couldn't feed his family. Uh, and there was no one really he could go to that was in a position of power. Uh, so he felt very helpless. Uh, so he went into the center of a public square. Um, and he told people about what he was complaining about and wrote, wrote out a thing. Uh, and then he set himself on fire, which is, a, as you can imagine, is a, quite, the, quite the sight, right? Um, well, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so in the region, this was in Tunisia, but this, the, what happened was shared on social media. If you remember, I was saying that uh, some people nicknamed it the Facebook revolution because people on Facebook were talking about this and what they were finding was that there were lots of other people who also were going through the same thing uh, and people found kind of a, a large regional kinship among people uh, and wanting to kind of rise up and revolt uh, and that was the very beginning that had already happened by the time I was I was in Egypt but the actual Arab Spring the full uprising hadn't happened yet but that's why I took this picture. <clears throat> well, these really wash out my, my slides. Oh. Um, hopefully you could kind of see here very green fields. As I mentioned before, the, the soils uh, along the Nile, especially in the, the flood zone, uh, that would get, get very rich uh, nutrients from the rainforest of Central Africa. You know, those rains and it would, uh, it would all come on down the Nile. So still pretty good productive land. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, 
uh, this is just kind of one of the shops I went by. I actually took a picture of this one because um, it says fixed price. Do people, have you ever seen that in a store? The word fixed price? Or anyone know what that is? Yeah. A place where you're not going to barter. Yeah, do people know what bartering is? I have a bookkeeper at this. Like, hey, can I go through the two for one deal? Like, make your own Yeah, so, you know, if you could imagine, you know, let's say you go to Target and you want to buy a shirt, you know, and it doesn't have a price on it. And you're like, yeah, well, I want to buy this shirt. How much is it? And they say, well, how much you got? It's like, how much do I got? I don't know. I got 10 bucks. They're like, well, it costs 20 bucks. And they're like, well, how? Like, well, I can't buy it then. They're like, I'll tell you what, 15. Right? And you haggle, you argue. Uh, that's again another kind of regionally common thing. That's why you'll have signs saying if something is a fixed price or not. Uh, I hate the haggling. I hate it because I'm just, I don't want to argue about a price, you know? Uh, and so, well, what I often did when I traveled is, I don't think I've told you guys this before, uh, would often say that I was Australian. Uh, Australian. Not because I'm like, I don't want to say I'm an American, but American tourists, like, people will chat you up in any store. One of the first things I ask is, oh, where are you from? Uh, Americans are known when they travel, they're traveling to shop and they're going to bring stuff home. So prices will be hiked up a bit. Uh, people most of the world don't uh, understand really accents very well. And so you could say you're from wherever, if you know a couple pertinent facts about Australia. Uh, the reason I would say I was Australian is because uh, Australians have a, a, a norm about traveling where, for example, it is usual, uh, like the two years, two years before you go to college and after high school, you travel for those two years, right? That's just kind of a normal thing that everybody does. And people just travel a lot uh, and they don't have a lot of money when they do it, right? So they, they're not spendy. They only spend money if they have to. So if you say you're Australian, usually they'll just give you the lowest price because they don't want to bother. They don't want to like go back and forth with you because you don't have any money anyway. Um, so that's a little, little trick if you want to try that. Uh, otherwise, like I said, you can get um, sometimes pretty aggressive sales. Uh, I forget if anyone's traveled in the region and have ever experienced kind of aggressive sales. Uh, what do you not? What do you? What do you not think uh, about? I'm thinking about specifically when I was in Italy. There was a lot of um, like street vendors that were very aggressive. Yeah. Um, depending on where you go, people will come out of the shops and they will they will you know like oh hey how are you doing nice to meet you and then they'll hold on to your hand and pull you into the shop like like aggressive sales um, and that's something that you just gotta you just culturally get used to it just like whether something is a fixed price or not. <clears throat> uh, I mentioned before about how in a, a lot of ancient cities, the transportation and the way you haul things around were through canals, and many places have just filled in their canals, but a lot of places it still makes sense to have them and use them, uh, and so there were still canals kind of all over the place in Egypt. Um, and you might have noticed when I showed you the news clip of a number of the buildings in the back kind of looked like this on the top, like they weren't, weren't quite finished. Uh, it's extremely common in Egypt. Um, I don't suppose anyone knows why that's a common for, for roofs in Egypt. Or hazard, hazard a guess. Uh, why would you think the roofs are usually like this in in Egypt are very often like this. In case of um, hurricanes or something? Oh no, they, they get near zero rain. Oh. Yeah. Or like flooding, because didn't you say you would get on like the highest or something like that? Hmm. Um, it is because of taxes. Because of taxes. Oh, so yeah. in Egypt, if your building is still technically under construction, you don't have to when you pay taxes, you pay taxes per level of your building, right? And so if you leave this unfinished, you don't have to pay taxes for 
this section of your building. So you'll see lots of the buildings, they always have the top unfinished because if you wrap it up, and if you're not getting any rain anyway, it's like, why not have it just open? It doesn't matter. Uh, and that's how you can actually often tell the age of buildings because that tax break only happens for five years. And then they're like, we're just gonna start taxing you for it. And that's when they're like, oh, I'll throw in a new, a new layer. So uh, that's why that is such a common thing. And in the cultural landscape, uh, just some more stuff in that shop. Uh, also, when you travel, you see that connection between people and their animals uh, a lot more, uh, you know, that, that we've seen in, uh, you know, guns, rooms, and steel, and things like that. Um, people still having their animals within the cities. Uh, our text talked about not just pyramids, but a lot of these step pyramids that were actually more common in other areas, kind of as you spread out from Egypt. Uh, but they're, they're, they're less touristy because they're not as big, not as kind of perfectly symmetrical. Some pillars. Uh, this is um, Pyramid of Giza. Uh, the, the tourism has gone down quite a bit from this. This was probably the last big peak of tourism because as I said, it was a good little while before um, the Arab Spring. This is uh, the Muhammad Ali Mosque, uh, not named after the fighter. The fighter is named after uh, the historical figure, Muhammad Ali. Um, but this was, uh, I didn't take pictures inside because uh, I was trying to be careful of not overstepping bounds as a tourist. It's one of those kind of interesting things when you travel, usually you read up on a place, right? And what are the cultural norms? What do you do that's respectful? That kind of thing. So for example, uh, when I went to the Vatican, right? When I read up on the Vatican, it said, you should dress conservatively, um, you know, long sleeves actually and buttoned up. Uh, and uh, for, for women, usually something covering the hair and things like this, they'd have specifics of, of what you should dress like. And it was very similar in Egypt. Um, when you go to a mosque, they want you to, to dress conservatively. But it's one of those, one of those unusual things. When I was there, actually, there were this was quite the tourist spot, um, and there was <clears throat> there was an American couple that were in there as tourists, and they were still wearing their their swimsuits. Yeah, and I was kind of like, oh, this is like, oh, is this the ugly American thing? And oh, this is why people don't like American tourists. Uh, but no one seemed to make a fuss. I was kind of surprised. I thought like people would be upset or something, and I asked my uh, my tour guide, and he said that in Egypt, because there have been tourists in Egypt for literally thousands of years, there's a bit more of a acceptance of of different cultures and different ways of doing things, and so there's more of a feeling of, you know, well that is that is their way, that's not our way, but you know that's that's their way, um, so it was more of a a live and let live kind of philosophy. The other interesting thing uh, that happened when, well, when I was here, there, there, there's having uh, prayer and whatnot. Um, and after the the prayer, everyone seemed really, really kind of just very relaxed, you know. Uh, and I asked my tour guide about this. Um, and he said, a phrase that maybe you've heard before, he said, um, uh, Islam is a, is a religion of peace, right? Uh, and there was someone else in our, uh, tour group who said, well, I don't understand that. What do you mean? There's still wars and stuff. So what do you mean religion of peace? And our tour guide said that, well, when they pray, um, they're, well, because God is peace. They, they're basically relaxing the mind and thinking of peace and peaceful thoughts. Um, and, and that is why when they're done, they're all seem very, very relaxed uh, and very, very kind of calm, cool, and collected. Yeah? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Can you speak a little louder? That's equivalent to like meditation for Buddhists or so like chanting. Church 
like a higher presence, or more conscious, or more aware in the, in the mind. Yeah. Um, like, I'd also compared it to meditation, and I was kind of like, you know, when I was a kid, uh, growing up and going to church, I would I'd just pray for stuff that I would want, you know, and I was like, you guys don't do that, and he's like, no, 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 we're, we're trying to meditate, as you say, yeah. Uh, I'm taking an Abrahamic traditions course right now, and um, Jewish prayer and Muslim prayer is very similar hmm. in a way that it's very communally centered, and it's all about coming together and praising God, where... Um, Christian prayer is more individualist. Yeah. 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 There's local local variations, of course, and all these different things. Um, I, I had also talked before about how the Nile, um, you know, had these floods every year, and about how now that there's a number of dams, the floods that would bring replenish the soils is not really coming back. There's a good amount of soil in lots of places that there's still good agricultural soil for a long time uh, that's happening. The other thing, the choices that places have to make, for example, uh, where the Aswan Dam is, and I'll show you some specific pictures of the dam later, um, you know, when you put in a dam, you fill up a large reservoir, right? Uh, and very often, this is a displacement of people because usually there are people who are living on that land uh, that, that fills up with water. And in Egypt, they actually uh, moved a number of the temples that were in this area. Uh, and this is one of them that they moved to higher ground. But most of them, you know, they couldn't really afford to move everything. So there's actually one of the things that people gave up kind of in the area uh, around Lake Nasser that has the Aswan Dam is, well, they, they gave up uh, a lot of the historical sites in their area because it's all underwater in that area anyway. Some of the carvings. Um, remember that ancient Egypt was a, a slave-based economy, as were many old in, ancient empires. Uh, this one looks like he should be on Star Trek, actually. I think he's kind of a pointy ear. Um, and that's when, when people talk about changes in societies through time. We talked about feudalism a little bit before. Uh, this is kind of the stage that often becomes a before feudalism, when we're looking at ancient societies. Uh, when I was on tour, I noticed that um, a lot of the faces of the, of the gods had been carved out. Um, does anyone know why, why that would be? Uh, on the back. Because of the Europeans and the Greeks, all of that came, they thought that these people had been Moses and they didn't want to believe that Africans could ever equivalent to that. Um, not big noses. Uh, it was Christians who carved these out because this area was Christian for hundreds of years. Uh, but it's because these were considered pagan gods, right? Uh, the Christians, uh, when they came through areas like many empires, they, they would try to change the cultural landscape to reflect their beliefs, right? It's somewhat ironic, though, that, that they carved out the faces because the, in, in the, these Egyptian gods, the faces were all meant to be identical because it was supposed to be a perfect being. And so you can't actually tell the difference between them from their faces, so it was kind of pointless. It's actually their hats, as you can see, were not carved off. But the hats are how you tell which god and which being it is. Uh, so somewhat ironic that if, if they would have actually researched a little bit about the culture that they were kind of destroying, they would have, well, they would have destroyed it better, I guess. Uh, but there was, usually if you see that these aren't carved out, it's because they, a lot of these were covered with in, in sand for many, many years, right? And they were, they had to be excavated. Those didn't have damage because they were protected by the sand from the elements and people. One of the other things uh, uh, this book chapter talks about is old cities versus new cities, right? Um, a lot of areas, this is Cairo, uh, a lot of areas of the world, um, you know, they have their old city, and the old city was usually designed and developed when most people still walked, so it's very compact. Uh, and what that means now is often that means that traffic 
can just be terrible going through the city. And often there aren't a lot of roads that go around the city. You know, if, like we have here, we have great big loops of highways that go around the cities, right? That's still actually a relatively new thing. Usually, most people were going to the city, so usually it's like the all roads lead to Rome, right? Like all the, the roads would go through the major cities, uh, so you get a lot of traffic jams and stuff these days. Uh, because the only other option besides having terrible traffic, it would be to destroy a bunch of the buildings, right? To make more room for people to drive through. But of course, that's, that's your history, right? You're in a place where buildings are 500,000 years old. Um, and those ones seem like they're the young buildings compared to the other buildings, right? <clears throat> Traffic jam. Just a little bit of a sights around. Oh, I, this is, um, saw a couple of these as we were driving around police vehicles that would have a bunch of people in them. Uh, what those are is, uh, if the police went around and found someone who, like, like the shop owner who was selling, selling fruit, if they didn't have money for bribes, you'd get locked up. And then you'd be locked up until someone would come in to pay your bribe for you, basically. So this was not an uncommon thing. Um, large military and police presence on the streets in general at the time. Um, at the time we were there, this was near the Christmas holiday, and uh, there had been lots of, um, well, there had been bombings. There had been bombings that had been going on. So every time we would go out, when we'd come back to the hotel, we'd put our bags through a scanner and everything, you know, uh, similar to when you go to the airport. But we didn't do that every time we go back to our hotel room. Um, one night, you know, I put my bag on the conveyor belt, uh, and I was just kind of going through the normal stuff. Uh, and one of the police guards, uh, who has one of those big machine guns, he comes up to me and he says, "Hey, hey, hey, what are you, what are you trying to pull here?" And I looked at this and I was like, "Is this my cell phone on top of my camera or something really weird like that?" And I'm trying to figure out exactly what is going on. <laughs> and then he pressed a button and it vanished. And he said, ah, ha, 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 And I was just like, he is lucky I did not, you know, crap myself, the guy with the machine gun. But that was, you know, a bit of a, a sense of humor, I guess, because I watched as that guy did that to, to many people, uh, just as a little joke. So, so humor changes on the region you're at. Well, I'm glad I had the thought to be like, hey, let me take a photo for my class, okay? Another canal, like I said, lots of canals still in use, because not only can you transport things, but actual water. Um, oh, this was, was at a restaurant. Uh, and because it was, uh, well, it was, it was Christmas time, uh, there was a family that was walking down the street and my guide said, oh, they're Christians, you should say hi. He's like, I should say hi, because they're Christians? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he said, they're all dressed up. You could tell because they're going out for a Christmas prayer. In the book, it talks a little bit about the Coptic Christians, which is about 10% of the population. Uh, but as I said, there were, it was uh, Christian for hundreds of years, and there's still a population there. Um, and what they'll do with jewelry-wise is they'll usually wear the same two things, one indicating that obviously they're a Christian, the other indicating that they're of Egypt, right? Um, and my guide was talking about how in Egypt, there's also more of an acceptance of that there's different peoples that make up Egypt, right? It's not a one people, uh, it's different ethnicities, different people, but they're still all Egyptian. And it's one of those things where it's like, well, you could look on any old temple and building that's thousands of years old, and you could see depicted on the building different types of people. So you know that these people have been around this area uh, since ancient times. These were a couple of sisters, like I said, they were dressed up for going out for Christmas services. Oh, I thought I included a picture of my meal here. Um, what I, we were eating when we were visited, it was a, 
local del delicacy, which is a uh, pigeon. Pigeon. Uh, has anyone eaten pigeon? Yeah. Yeah. What'd you think? It tasted like chicken. It tasted like chicken. Uh, the one I had was like okay, but it was a bit rough. But mostly what it is is it's the stuffing. They stuff it with rice and a bunch of herbs and things, and that's mostly what you're eating because a pigeon doesn't have a lot on it. It was good to me. Yeah. Um, but that's the only place I have eaten pigeon. Oh, so now we're at the, the Aswan Dam that I was telling you about. Now this is way down in Lower Egypt. Oh, this color is all washed down in all these pictures. Um, this is kind of near the border of Sudan. Uh, and as I said, when you go through Egypt, there's, there are different ethno uh, ethnicities in different places, uh, and sometimes different languages, different cul cultures. <clears throat> This was the area that is, uh, if you remember looking at the maps in the Rias region, there's an area that's kind of defined as uh, Nubian area. That's kind of where this was, is. My guide was telling me about, uh, this is just some things that are being sold. Uh, this water that we're on a boat on is the, the man-made lake that, it, that has come about from the Aswan Dam that was put in. <clears throat> um, and this is just kind of one of your normal things you'll see people selling their stuff. But you can see that the clothes are a bit different than the other regions. Uh, interestingly, um, my guide was showing me that this area is in some ways more economically prosperous because they do have money from a big hydroelectric uh, dam that is there, right? And so there is some more manufacturing and whatnot and things that kind of bring money in economically. Uh, but again, this is the area that a bunch of the ancient ruins of ancient civilizations in this area are now under a lake, right? And so you, they gave up some things and got some other things. These are the kind of the decisions places have to decide. This is just good infrastructure. Um, so this is, this is the lake. Uh, so one of the other things about this, like I said, the, the things that people have to give up, well, it's good that you, you, know, you put in a dam and you fill up a great big reservoir, so if you need water in emergencies and stuff, but because of the region this is in, the climate and the weather, uh, about half of the water that would normally go down the rest of the Nile is evaporated off of this lake, right? And so that's a lot of water uh, that, that the country's kind of given up for this project. And also, as I said, you don't have the floods coming through like you did regularly. These are more ruins that were moved, moved uphill in elevation. These are some areas that my guide had said uh, had been more farmable in the past, but through the years, because there's not new soil kind of bringing, being brought in from Central Africa, um, some of that desertification that we've talked about is going on. See some of those roofs again. Oh, this picture is really washed out. Um, no, that picture's terrible. Well, let me tell you a little story about this picture, even though you can't really see it. Uh, this is a boat at night. Um, when the first night that I was there, uh, we got on our, a very large boat because we're doing a cruise down the Nile. Uh, and it's myself and, you know, mostly foreigners not from the area. But we were basically getting ready to go to bed. And then up on the, the upper deck, there is all of a sudden these big poundings, just like boom, thud. And like a thud and a crash. And... Um, you know, we had met some of the other tourists before this, uh, and they, they kind of came to me, I think, because I am tall. Uh, and they're like, you should go and see what's going on. Because there's also this shouting happening. We couldn't quite understand what was going on. And I was like, well, okay. So I go up uh, to the top deck, and I don't see anything specific. And then all of a sudden, um, this great big sack comes flying in and hits the deck. 
Um, and another one came, and I was like, this is very strange. And so I go to these sacks and I open it up, and one of them is a whole bunch of that jewelry I was showing you pictures of. Like jewelry that's just like that, that was in the sack. And I go to another one, and it's a whole bunch of scarves. And I was just like, I have no idea what's going on. There's some shouting coming up from these boats that were uh, around us. And I go over and I lean over. Um, you know, I say, you speak English? Uh, and they say, yes. I'm like, okay, well, do, is this your stuff? And they're like, yeah, yeah. Which, which do you want to buy? And I was like, I, do I want to buy? And they're like, yeah. What, what do you want to buy? Um, and they wanted to barter and haggle for the stuff. And that when I talk about aggressive sales, it's like, well, they were the first people to sell us stuff, I guess, when we got into the country. But what was the norm, apparently, so if this ever happens if you're traveling, what, what you're, you, you take one of these sacks, you pick out the jewelry you want, you haggle a price, and then you just throw it back. Whatever you don't buy, you throw back and you throw money. It seems like a very trusting kind of uh, uh, bartering system. Um, but that's, that's, that's why this picture doesn't work. <laughs> None of my pictures of the time turned out because it was too dark. But um, aggressive sales, like they, they did make sales. Once I told other people what was going on, they're like, oh yeah, I'll, let me look at the scarves, you know. Uh, so they made money. A little further down the mile. Uh, again, some areas, when we talk about desertification and places being less agriculturally productive, very often it turns uh, into grazing land, right? If something too, too sparse to be grown on crops. Uh, this is further down the Nile. Uh, at the time, and our chapter talks a lot about Hosni Mubarak, Hosni Mubarak, who was the, the president at the time. Um, and he, he liked to name a lot of stuff after himself, which made it actually pretty confusing to, when you're getting around. Because if, if everything is a Mubarak road, and everything is a Mubarak hospital, and everything is a Mubarak this and that. Um, but that's kind of an example of the, the regime that was a bit on the authoritarian side. Right? Um, this is an example of, I don't know if you can see that he has a bit of a concerned look, right? That's because whenever you go through these different checkpoints, you never know how much they're gonna decide to make you pay, right? So this guy is finding out right now maybe that his whole trip won't have been worth it, he won't make money, or he might find out that maybe they don't want a lot and he could still, he could still make money off of whatever he's carrying around. But this is why in general, and I was talking to people a lot about this because as I said, the, the, the thing in Tunisia where the guy set himself on fire, that had happened and that was in the news. And I asked people about what did they think about uh, Mubarak um, in places that were having more protests. And what they had said to me was, when this country and a lot of countries in the region first got their independence from their colonial, colonial powers, right? When they had their revolutions very often the person who's the leader of that revolution, when they got power, they would say something along the lines of, well, we have an emergency situation, just had a revolution, I'm gonna be the president for an amount of time until we can get stable, until things are st stable and we can have democratic elections, right? And this happened to a number, you know, Gaddafi over in Libya, um, this happened in a number of different places but then what happened was uh, that transition to a democracy just never happened, right? And so Mubarak had been president for something like 40 years, and that was the case in lots of these different countries where the same person who was in charge when they had their revolution uh, and they first got control of their own country, that person stayed in power and did not give up power. And the people that I talked to, there was a general feeling that people wanted to have a democracy they wanted to kind of develop and have the normal trajectory of many countries that have developed, right? Um, the feeling was, when I talked to people at the time, that Mubarak was getting older and that he would eventually retire and then they would transition to democracy. Some people that I talked to felt like Mubarak was setting up a son to take over. 
And what their question was, well, if we kicked out the colonial powers because they had their kings and queens that were in charge and that, you know, we don't want a kind of semi-fascist thing, well, then how is this different if this is going to be a lineage of someone who still has all the power and control? And in Syria, that transition had happened. The son had been in power, is still now in power. Um, and once he had fully gotten in power, that's part of the reason why in the Arab Spring, when it got to Syria, it was a bit of a stalemate because the new guy had gotten fully in power. And so when people tried to revolt, he had enough power and control to push it down. So now there's been a civil war in Syria basically ever since. Um, most of the rest of the countries did not have that transition. Um, in, in Egypt, for example, and our book talks about this in great detail, they had their, their uprising, Arab Spring, Mubarak removed from office. They had a democratic election, and the guy who won uh, was the leader of the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, have people heard of that Muslim Brotherhood? Uh, anyone able to summarize what the what the Muslim Brotherhood is? Yeah, during during Mubarak's time, um, they were against the law. They couldn't go for office and whatnot. Uh, but what they became known for locally was actually. Um, a lot of kind of uh, charitable things and helping people out actually. Uh, they had through the years kind of earned a good name among the local population and they are an organization that has a fair amount of money. Um, and so through the years, even though uh, they were persecuted by Mubarak, um, they gained a fair amount of local popularity. Well, as I just said, they won the presidency, right? Uh, when they won the presidency, they attempted to change course of the country away from a secular government toward a more specifically religious government. Um, when that happened, a whole bunch of protests came back uh, that had been going on before. Um, and eventually the military stepped in and took power, and they still have power today. And I, I haven't heard of any specifics about a thought of a transition back to democracy again, but that's kind of where we are now. A lot of countries are going through a lot of stuff during the pandemic. A lot of places are having yet new revolutions, so who knows what will be the case in this region a few years from now. It's tough to say. Um, uh, also, Egypt is known for a lot of high quality uh, rocks and stonework by people. A lot of this is still done by hand. Uh, also big perfume industry. These are when I mentioned that you could have you could have bricks that are hundreds of years old that are just made from mud. Um, a lot of the infrastructure in the area is just uh, concerned with moving water around, right? Because again, it's a, it's a dry area. When you, if you travel there, the, the tap water um, isn't really something that you should drink because uh, it's not that it has uh, microbes and things that will, that will give you an upset stomach uh, like most places. Like if you travel most places anywhere in the world, it's foreign bacteria and stuff in the water, so you'll get sick a little bit. This is why people have tra traveler's illness. Uh, but here, the water, it, it will have kind of a chlorine smell because it's highly treated, highly treated. And so your tap water in your place is more for cleaning and doing different things, but not necessarily for drinking. Um, so you, you want to usually buy or get some filtered water. Um, oh, this is the, as I was talking about Hosni and Mubarak, he, he also used to put his picture just kind of all over the place. So you could have, have his picture as you'd be out and about. This is just another one of those checkpoints I was talking about, lots of these checkpoints. Um, the other thing that happened at the time was there had been a large construction boom, because um, at the time the tourist industry was growing, and Egypt as a country was actually 
developing at a real good pace. Um, and so things were, right before the revolution, were looking, well, relatively good. Um, again, it wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, it was a bit more on the authoritarian side as far as development in that sense. Um, but then after the revolution happened, um, tourism dried up, uh, and a, a lot of the places that had been built up, um, you know, whole buildings and whatnot, uh, are still vacant because the economy really kind of got stuck at that point. Fortunately, as I said before, they're in a climate where, you know, these will still be in relatively good repair for if the economy does come back, they could just fix them up. Um, whereas, you know, if this was Minnesota, you know, if you had snow in these windows and the seasons changed, it would be, you just have to tear it down again, right? Um, oh, and man, these pictures are getting really washed out. This is actually Paris, which I flew through to get to Egypt, and I thought it was ironic that, you know, Egyptian trophies are still on display in European countries, right? Uh, and Egypt wants these back, you know? Um, and I'm still kind of surprised that more haven't been brought back because you could just make a reproduction of this and people wouldn't know the difference and send the actual artifact back. But that's when the, one of the things when you're a tourist in, in Egypt, you'll be going around ancient sites and it'll be like, oh, there's a giant statue. And you'll be like, oh yeah, the head is in the British Museum, the arm is over in Italy, the other arm is actually over in some other country. All the, all the parts have been taken of a lot of the really huge things, right? If people, if the colonial powers could break something off and take it back to kind of show off their, their ill-gotten gains, uh, well, they would. They would do that. Uh, all right. Actually, we talked about this stuff in the last class quite a bit. I'm trying to remember if there's any big things that we missed. Oh, I guess I would say one of the main things about cities in this region, as they have developed, um, you'll have the old central city that will have all the kind of classic things. Um, but then you have an outlying kind of suburban almost area, closer in than what we usually call suburbs. Um, but you'll have the new construction and kind of new buildings um, that will look more modern, you know, glass towers and all that. But they'll be kind of encircling outside of the main central city. Um, and that's where more of the economic life happens through time. Um, Hearths of ancient civilizations, as you can see, not just not just the Nile, but other areas of the world. And we'll of course talk about these different ones as we get to these regions. <clears throat> and then let's see. I think I talked about a lot of this stuff last time. Mm -hmm. Let me think what else. Um, when we talk about urbanization. You know, we're talking about people who live in, in cities and still in this region, there's still a very uh, big kind of core area uh, and people who are living in the, the rest of the areas, it's technically rural. Um, many, many areas around here, especially even places that are relatively more developed, will still have half the population living in areas that are rural. Uh, changes place by place, as you see. Yeah, the Arab Spring also talked about Let's see. Oh, one of the other um, one of the other reasons why the the Arab Spring happened was at the time there was relatively high unemployment, especially among young people. All right, young people weren't feeling like they had control over their lives. They definitely didn't have control of the local police and authorities, um, and they were well becoming activists, trying to hope to to change these scenarios. Right, because a uh, uh, high unemployment for young people. Population map, um, as you can see, well, because you know it's very, very dry, very arid. Your populations are kind of scattered about. Um, historically, there's been a lot more kind of travel and communication among this area than really between these areas. These are much more kind of cut off from each other. As you can see, the population here is mostly along the Nile. 
um, and ancient, ancient uh, Egyptian and, and semi-Egyptian uh, cultures and societies actually uh, exist all along this, but people, these, these, these ones have kind of degraded a bit more through time um, and do not have quite the, the same tourist industry. Um, corruption in Egypt. Well, I was talking about you know, how he was a pretty uh, major authoritarian. Um, a lot of people felt, and this is in, in countries in the region, felt that those leaders who had taken power way back when the first revolutions were happening uh, were just siphoning money from the country to their personal bank accounts. Um, and it turned out after, after the regimes were toppled and they were able to actually look into the finances and whatnot that they were correct. Money had been siphoned from the country, from the ordinary uh, people of the country, into the bank accounts of ruling families. You know, as I was saying, the, the big tops of, of these giant statues would be still in other countries. Uh, if you've ever been to the British Museum, uh, you just you walk and you go. It goes on and on and on, and it's all all more of this kind of thing. Um, let's see. This chapter also talks about Israel and the the history of 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 this area, which is very complex and difficult thing to summarize quickly. So I'm going to summarize it in very broad strokes. Uh, well, we've talked about colonialism in the region, right? Um, British actually, within Europe, British had power over this area for quite a while. Um, and there was a number of Jewish people who lived here historically through time, but uh, Israel didn't have the very large population that it has today. Uh, the British started kind of basically selling off land to people, um, people of Jewish origin, and this happened a little bit before the, the Second World War, but then after the Second World War, it really picked up um, because obviously after the Second World War, uh, the Jewish population in Europe, much of them, well, didn't want to live there anymore, right? They wanted to have a place that was uh, a specific homeland. Um, so this was, of course, seemed like the, the natural place. Now, of course, there was a population that was living here, Palestinians. Palestinians. Now, Palestinians, under the British colonial law, didn't own any of the land, right? It was owned by the British, because they were the ones who, who stole it, right? Um, and so they were selling it to other populations, and, and when the people they would sell to would come to the area, they would just kick the people out who was living there, right? It's like, it's like you've been here, your family and culture has been here for thousands of years, but we bought it, so you gotta head out. Uh, this led to a giant refugee crisis in neighboring countries, especially Jordan, but neighboring countries because the Palestinian populations had to find a place to live, right? And you had places that already had plenty of people, not a lot of resources. Um, so again, painting this in broad strokes, after a while, the neighboring countries decided uh, a military conflict, right? And so there was a military conflict, and uh, what was at the time a new nation of Israel with a new population um, had comparatively, compared to the rest of the region, a gigantic military and a huge military budget. And so these wars, uh, often just lasted for, for days. Uh, and they would be won overwhelmingly by uh, Israel. And so for example, let's just talk about the conflict with Egypt, uh, Egypt and Israel, right? You had the original border, Egypt attacked, Israel took this land in that conflict, right? Took really giant chunk of, of Egypt um, in that conflict. Uh, most of these conflicts, Israel overwhelmingly won, uh, in a nutshell. Now, through time, there was an effort to try to seek peace, and the term land for peace 
Uh, I think that's used in our textbook. If you've heard that term before, what that means is Israel would, well, again, let's just stick with Egypt, would say with Egypt, you know what? We don't want to have a conflict. We don't want to go to war. As you know, we have overwhelming force on our side anyway. So we'll give you all this back. But you have to agree that this is our border and that you won't cross it. In Egypt, well, said, yeah, that's a giant, giant piece of our country. Let's just agree to that, all right? So that's the land for peace. There's still, of course, a lot of conflict because even in the areas that were in the, the then agreed upon borders, you still have populations who are buying the land, right? And moving into land and then still today, like kicking Palestinians out. And they um, move into smaller areas and sometimes they move to other countries, uh, but it's still, uh, that refugee crisis uh, still exists. All right, like I said, that's again a very, very big summary of this conflict. Just skipping ahead here, seeing if there's any other giant conflicts I need to summarize in a matter of minutes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about oil in the region. Oil. Uh, we've talked about commodity chains, right? And often during the colonial relationships, let's we'll just we'll use just oil as the main example. Um, the price for oil was kept very low because the colonial powers were getting it at basically no cost because they were just taking it. You know, it's like, well, oil's very cheap if you just take it. Uh, so oil had a very low, low cost to it. When these countries gained independence, um, included in that usually was control of their own oil resources. And they looked at the price of oil and they're like, well, if we're gonna develop, we can't really still keep the price of oil like as near free. Right? It's like we have millions of people, right? And we want to develop, we want to have money, we want to have all the normal things that developed places have, that costs money. So they said, well, what should the price of oil be? Difficult question to, to answer. But what they did see is that oil was a huge part of the world's economy, right? Um, the, the, the world runs on, on these oil supplies. And so they did some analysis and they're like, well, we could, we could raise the price of oil, um, and that's something that, that can be, you know, the rest of the world will just have to pay it. And if they don't want to, I don't know, they could do something else. Uh, so the price of oil went up, and these created um, great big economic shocks to lots of places around the world, because if you can imagine, if the price of oil doubles, and the next year it doubles again, right? What would happen at the time was all of a sudden automobile manufacturers around the world started making smaller cars, right? Started making more fuel efficient manufacturing, like plastics involve a lot of oil and they started differentiating out different products and things like that. Um, so that big kind of shock to the economy that happened in the 70s, this is why if you see TV shows or movies from the 70s, uh, it was called the stagflation crisis and that's why the economy is usually looking pretty bad. Um, it's because there are a lot of these oil shocks as well as other things happening. Um, and so there was all this oil wealth that a lot of countries were able to get their hands on. And some of them, well, some have far more oil, right, than others. Countries in northern uh, Africa, as you can see, they have oil resources, but very little compared to lots of the other kind of big countries. And then you also have the system of countries and how much, well, how much the locals benefit from those oil prices and things, right? So you can see Iran is, is one of these countries. The people have seen on the news, the US and Iran talking about uh, nuclear power. People seen that in the news at all? Um, people know what that is or what, what's going on with any of that? Sure. I know that countries in the Middle East want nuclear power so they can modernize and get massive amounts of energy 
and it's very controversial because uh, nuclear technology is very dangerous. Yeah. What's that? That being said, there's so many countries in the world with nuclear capabilities that who's to say who can have nuclear power and who can not have nuclear power? Who is to say? It's a good question. Well, let's stick with the example of Iran. Um, well, so the U.S., you know, we have our own oil industry. We Like, if you go to Texas or California, you see a lot of oil mines, or, you know, um, oil wells. But we use all of it, right? We don't, we import more oil because what we have is, because we consume so much oil, we have even more oil coming in. Iran has been developing at a reasonable kind of pace, um, including building of a middle class, and like a lot of development uh, that, you, that places want to have has happened in Iran um, to the point where they use up most of their oil among their own population, right? Now, and that's for things like, like electricity, which, you know, we use coal and different things for. Well, they don't have coal over there. They got a lot of oil. They got some natural gas, and so that's what they use. Now, if, for example, they switch their electric grid to nuclear, well, then all that oil would be on the market, and the price for oil would plummet a good amount. Um, so there are things that would be good about it as far as Americans and standard living and stuff. Price of oil would go down. They'd be able to actually be making more money, right, because they'd be able to export this oil instead of just using it up themselves. But again, that question of nuclear power, but you have countries like France or Germany where like half of their power is from nuclear energy. There are a lot of countries that have very leaned in on it as, as a clean fuel source. And I know you might think nuclear power clean, it's like, well, it's not creating a lot of pollutants like coal immediately. It creates you know, radioactive debris that you need to store somewhere, but it's smaller amounts comparison. Uh, so a lot of places, as I said, are leaning toward using that as a fuel source, but the US does not want Iran to. Um, We'll see if that stays. Iran has offered to let uh, U.S. personnel monitor their nuclear power uh, and, and watch what happens and, and, and monitor to make sure it's not turned into weapons. And it's a fair point to say that like there are lots of countries, these countries over here all have nuclear power, these countries even above here, like all the surrounding countries all have nuclear power. Like, Turkey has nuclear power, you know, like all these countries have it. So it's like, well, all right, well, I am running out of time. Uh, I actually talked too much to really have you guys work on some questions. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna have you sign your name on here for your 10 points for today. Sign your name, and let's just call it a day today.